Okay. So first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Oh, uh, put some lights on. I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm going to be preaching to the choir here because I'm sure most of you know more than I do. But I may have thought about things in a little different way uh, because I I'm not really a I wasn't a gardener or a farmer, but uh, I've kind of become one. So here it is. This is me and my family up picking blueberries on Hillside. And uh, in 2000, we bought a little house in a decent sized house in New Nacka Valley. And, uh, and we started this journey. Oh, I'm sorry. And so when we bought the house, it actually came with the house guest. We bought the house with a friend. And he had invited somebody to stay that lived in the bush, that was the principal out in the bush. And so he would go away every day, and he'd come back with a handful of fresh vegetables from some friend of his that had a garden. And my wife and I both had this revelation. <coughs> vegetables have taste. <laughs> we grew up here. We didn't know. <laughs> when, yeah. Back in the 70s and 80s, vegetables you got at the grocery store didn't have taste. <laughs> you might be right. I don't know anymore. <laughs> but uh, so when we bought the house, this is what the backyard looked like. That was a, a kiln that actually went with the uh, the owners, and the rest was just rolling chickweed. <laughs> this is what it looked like two years ago. Wow! 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 We changed it a little bit. Raised chickweed. Yeah. <laughs> So now we grow about 1,500 pounds of food. We do it with raised beds. We do it with our little solar cell greenhouse. Uh, we do a lot with containers on our deck. And uh, we do a lot with, or a fair amount with some unusual garden spaces as well. So I'll we'll show you some of those. Uh, raised beds, we have 340 square feet. And then we also have a plot out at the community garden uh, that's 120 square feet. So we have 460 square feet or so of uh, garden space. And uh, the greenhouse I built maybe six years ago now. Uh, it's a solar style, which means that it's glazed on the south side in the east exposure, insulated on the north side and the west side. Uh, there's 4,500 pounds of concrete in it, in the form of this bench right here, which is just stacked cinder blocks. Uh, there's cinder pavers on the floor, and there's uh, ceramic wall tiles on the back wall. And what that does for me is with this fan up here, whenever the temperature gets above 55 degrees, this fan kicks on. It blows air down through this plastic tube, which is just a piece of plastic that we made of. It blows through this uh, through the stack cinder blocks. They're stacked so that the channels all run parallel. It cools that air about 15 degrees and stores that heat in this uh, unit. We have That's a back pretty smart. Yeah, it works really well. <laughs> uh, we have a backup heater in it. Uh, I opened the greenhouse the second week of March this year, which was about the March 11th. Uh, the greenhouse hasn't been below freezing that day. The, the, my thermostat on my heater is, will only go to 36, so I can't set it quite as low as I would like. But um, in the month of March, we have it, it has only kicked on enough to use three pounds of propane. So, uh, it, and the last Two weeks it hasn't gotten below 46, so it hasn't even thought about coming on. It's just just from storage heat during the day, so it's, it's pretty uh, pretty cool actually because I don't have to heat it, but it stays real stable. The other thing it does is in the summertime when it's hot, uh, it doesn't get hot. Before I put the thermal mass in there on a sunny day, it would spike at 110, 120 degrees, and I would be doing everything I could to evacuate the heat to keep it cool enough to keep from cooking my plants. With thermal mass. It never gets above 85. Mm. So it yeah. makes a huge difference. Pardon? The bricks cool it as well as heat? Pardon? The bricks cool it? They just heat? absorb the heat and stabilize it. So mm -hmm. they just, it, takes it just, yeah, just balances the heat. I so didn't, it, I didn't realize that because I have a lot of trouble with that. In the summer getting too hot. Right. 
And it's the same concept as water, but the advantage to this is with this active cooling, it does take some electricity, but the advantage is it does cool better. And I don't have to throw that heat out the building and then try and keep it warm in the evening. I've got a much more stable temperature all the way around. So how long, how, how tall are your cinder blocks and how long is that run? Uh, well, it's a 16 foot run because it's a 16 foot length of greenhouse and they're, they're counter height. So they're uh, about five, six, I think it's yeah. five, yeah, five courses. I remember right. And the, it the has hot air goes years. through all of them. The hot air, yeah, they're stacked so that the channels all run parallel. So rather than stacking with the with the channels facing down, which is how you would normally stack them, you turn them on their side so that the channels run through. And and then do you, does the fan turn on in the summer and take the hot air down there? Yep. Yeah. As soon as it gets to be 55 degrees, the fan comes on. So it's it's solid blocks. The width of that. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I should have wrote down the numbers because I went and counted them the other day. <laughs> so I can tell you how much it weighs. But it, but it's solid. Blocks. It's just, just a stack of cinder blocks as a as a bench, yeah. Uh, and I, it, it's now on the south side underneath the pony wall, so there's no glazing on that side. Uh, and I used to have benches there and then have them on the back side, thinking that the heat from the sun hitting them would help warm them up. But it didn't make any difference. And the heat, the heat gain is all from pulling the air through it. And so this way I'm able to use get rid of the benches which just had pots stored under them, didn't do, do me any good, it just wasted space. Do that and then I have more room I can put taller stuff in the back now. So, how, how tall is your greenhouse? Uh, well, the, these panels are uh, 4 by 10, so, but it's actually, so it's probably 12 feet at the peak because it's that funny shape. And it's only about uh, 5 feet. A little, little over five feet at the back wall. It's, the face is at 68 degrees, which is just the optimum for our latitude for early season um, sun. So that it warms up sooner and stays warm later and doesn't get as much sun during the summer when it's so it kind of self shading in the summer when we get lots of heat. Why, why do you have the, all the windows on the south side since the south side is always the hottest? Because that's where the sun is. The light. Well, I, I realize that, but I mean, so I, I, I used to have a house that had had the, the sunroom on the south side. That's where mm -hmm. the people had built it. And so we always had a huge problem in the summertime. We were always 100 degrees. That's why we have the thermal mass, yeah. And then in the wintertime, we were always freezing. And, and when I started doing research for the house that we're in now, we want to build a, we want to build a, a another sunroom. But we've been wanting to put it on the west side, and I'm just, and so I'm, just, I guess I'm perplexed at, at uh, how for a greenhouse, how can we chose to put it on the south side versus the west side? So I wanted to gain the maximum amount of light and the maximum amount of heat. That's what I want. I want. I want the heat. I'm not unlike a house where you don't want the heat. Right. My house has big southern exposure as well. But <coughs> what that was when we designed that, it has an overhang such that. Starting June 1st, the light doesn't hit the windows. Before June 1st, we do get solar gain. After June 1st, we don't get solar gain. So the hot part of the year, we're not getting any solar. In the spring and the fall, when we want it, when we don't want to have to make heat, if we can avoid it, we're using the sun to heat it. So it's house design is a little more complicated than greenhouse design, but um, but both of them, you can use the sun smartly or fight it. Yeah, if, if you do it wrong. So you understand that he he soaks the heat into those bricks into those and bricks, then they yeah. release it later so that he doesn't have to heat in the evening. That's very cool. Yeah. Just, just, you just, could do that in your house too, but mm -hmm. yeah, Somehow. in fact, there's there's a lot of greenhouse or house design that did that in the 70s mm -hmm. with the thermal storage. It's not really you really need to shade it in the hot part of the year, otherwise, yeah, it's gonna overheat. And this is our deck garden, and I have to apologize because I didn't. I'm a gardener. I'm not a presenter, and so when I started doing these presentations uh, in, the in the middle of winter, I didn't have any pictures of this garden. But uh, 
It runs the entire length of my southern exposure on my deck here, 16 feet. It's three, uh, three tiered high, just, again, just cinder blocks with pine boards, really low tech. Uh, but I can fit 63 four gallon pots, or five, four and a half gallon pots across there. Um, and then we cover it. This is, this is actually last week. Uh, the plants are pretty small right now, but they're doing just fine uh, with that southern exposure. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, but anyway, that's a big part of my, my production is that deck. And uh, it's amazing what you can grow not in a garden. And then my unusual garden spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what everybody's looking at, but this is just my flower boxes. And we, we used to plant those all with flowers. Now they rotate from flowers and lettuce and herbs. And uh, this time of year, or we, just, we just planted those. They're still about this big. They're in the greenhouse. In a couple of weeks, we'll bring them out, and they'll have our lettuce in it. Herbs are started. They'll follow. We'll intersperse those with flowers so that we have some pretty, but mostly we spend most of our time on edibles. And then uh, my, my strawberry patch is a little different than most people's strawberry patch. Uh, and again, this is, that, this is that same deck. This is just the, the railing side. Uh, and we used to run strawberries all across the top of the railing. And they did great. And I said, yeah, I wish I could grow more strawberries. <laughs> and uh, one day I was walking along my fence and I looked up and I went, hey. <laughs> so that was last year's experiment. This year it's going to be twice as big. So we had 163 strawberry plots plants last year. And those hanging? They're, they're actually just made with shelf boards, or I mean with fence boards, cedar I mean, fence boards. Are the strawberry plants a hanging type? Uh, no, they're, they're a standard uh, ever-bearing they're seascape. They you have to pick on a ladder. That, that's, yeah, that was last year. I'm actually going to build a catwalk this year so that I don't have to stand on it. No, because the, the, the roof slides there, so I can't leave the catwalk up. It has to be something I can take down, otherwise I won't have any place for the snow to go except my neighbor's yard, and I don't know if they would really be happy about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when you get ready to do that compact block, you might be able to come up with some material that you could. Oh, great. Okay, so now we're now's the reason you guys are here. You're asked. I'm supposed to talk about growing vegetables in containers, and so we're going to talk about the different things that are involved. Containers. I like. Lightweight, sturdy. I like nursery containers. They're boring, they're ugly, but I'm into production, and so <laughs> that's a big benefit for me. And they're cheap, because I'm cheap. Um, that's frugal. Frugal, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, nursery containers, you could use pretty plastic ones, and we do have some pretty plastic ones that we have in, out front so that our house doesn't look quite so much like a farm. But, uh, but they need to be light, they need to drain well. Um, this year with Debbie, we did a project uh, with ACS, which is Anchorage Children's Services, and built a bunch of uh, earth boxes, which are self-watering style planters built out of uh, tubs. And I'm going to experiment with some of those. Yeah, built out of these. Really? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some of those a try because uh, particularly in my greenhouse, I think that might be a big boon for my tomatoes because uh, that's the one place I struggle with. Yeah, nice and deep. Pardon? Nice and deep. Yeah. Yeah. Verna Pratt gave us a talk one time, you know her? Mm hmm On tomatoes. You should talk to her. She does it in tubs, but she doesn't think they need to be that deep. I think she has shallower ones. Do you all remember? Well, half of that, third of that tub is a water reservoir. And that's, oh, actually, oh, yeah. and that's actually a deeper one than, than what right. we use. That's, yeah. one, that's a 24 gallon. We use the 18 gallons, which are about four inches. Cool. Shallower. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So, yeah. And soil. And this is my mix that I use in my, my pots. Debbie and I would discuss that we have different tastes in what we use, but I like garden soil in my pots because I like the biology that's in the garden soil. Mm. So that's why I use it. Mm. I, uh, I use compost, which you can see a little glimpse of my old man compost here. I built this a couple years ago. Uh, it's all elevated, so I can wheel my wheelbarrow underneath these little shelves oh here. I have a screen that fits up over the top of that. So I can literally just lift out these planks, break my compost into wow. the sifter, sift it right into the wheelbarrow. I never have to lift it. Oh the only time I lift it is when I put the compost bucket from the thing in, which isn't very heavy. Uh, do you, so you don't stir them? Don't stir them. I have three bins and they, I get enough production out of that. I get three, almost four yards of compost every year out of that. So. Wow, what a clever thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Joe's a friend for life. <laughs> I don't like the shovel. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I'm, the older I get, I, I hit 50 this year. And I, I, to be, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I love the club, the, all these clubs I've been involved with. It cracks me up here. I just did a class, just taught a class with a friend of mine on um, building a wooden cabinet, and it was billed as the geezer in the kid. And I'm thinking, really? Should the 50 year old be called the kid? But it just depends on who you hang out with, I guess. So the other thing with containers is to keep them moist. The biggest problem with vegetables in containers is that if you let them dry out, it stresses the plant. Plants, plants get stressed, they don't taste good. They get bitter. So I, that's one of the things that we had to learn. We could grow beautiful plants, but we go, why they taste so bad in the containers? And that's what it turned out to be. It, was, it wasn't feeding, it wasn't temperature, it was just water stress. That's true of all plants. Except peppers. Except peppers? Mm -hmm. Peppers like to be stressed. When they're really hot, that's called stress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, seeing, I have, yeah, isn't that cute? That's because I didn't have any good pictures of flowers or plants to put in there. So, <laughs> figured the other thing I feed. You know. uh, but I have a very careful, structured feeding regimen that I follow uh, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes I don't because I look at the plant and it says, hey, I'm still hungry. You know, if we've got a lot of sun and a lot of heat, things happen faster. I need to up my, my production. So you do have to pay attention to the pots, or the vegetables in pots, more so than in the garden, I think, because, again, they just have less to draw on. And what I feed my plants with is a combination of fish emulsion and seaweed. I do fish emulsion at half strength every two weeks and I do seaweed every three weeks unless I start to develop issues where then I try and figure out what it is and, and increase whatever supplement that it looks like the plant needs. Usually it's potassium, so usually it's the seaweed I have to increase a little bit. So you by using containers, does that take care of not having any slugs? The ones on the deck never have slugs. The containers in the yard, I still have to deal with slugs. Um, but yeah, the ones, the ones that are 20 feet in the air, no slugs, it's great. Copper. I used to burn it, it goes up on your garage. Yeah. Does the uh, seaweed add potassium or take potassium? It adds. Mm -hmm. Let's see. When you say seaweed, what are you using? I'm using the liquid seaweed um, fertilizer from the beach. How do you tell when a plant might say it turns light yellow? Do you know what it's missing? You know, what I do is I go to my library and figure it and read because I can't remember. I have too many other things going on in my life. It's just, I, unlike Debbie, I didn't get a degree in this, so I have to. Well, I can't remember either. Yeah, so that's, yeah, it depends because it, you know, did it turn yellow in the veins or did it turn yellow between the veins? Because those mean two different things. So. Turn yellow in the bottom leaves or the top leaves? Top leaves, exactly. So yellow in the bottom leaves is not enough food. They're hungry. They're eating themselves. But that one don't I don't you over, when you over water sometimes? I know it would do the same that. thing because yeah. you're leaching your, yeah. your nutrients. Yeah. Or you're so. starving because it's not taking up water for you. Right. So. 
So yeah, you have to, I mean, it's gardening. You have to pay attention to the plants. That's the whole point. And then pest control, your, your slug question. Uh, I use a ton of floating row cover. I buy it in the 500 foot roll from Mill and Feed, and every garden I have this time of year until probably, well, a lot of it, all the time, I have floating row cover. Because again, I'm not growing for pretty, I'm growing for food. Uh, and I, does everybody know what floating row cover is? It is, it's this spun bonded cloth. I don't think this is like a near. It's, it's a kind of semi-translucent spun bonded polyethylene, so it's open for fabric. Really you know lightweight. The interfacing is? For the interfacing yeah. for clothing? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's basically very, very really thin version of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's great because you can literally just lay it right on the plants. Uh, according to Elliot Coleman, he's done some scientific testing and it gives eight degrees of frost protection, or eight degrees warmer. And uh, it also holds, increases the moisture content along the plant, so you don't have as much transpiration. You get a lot more uh, humid climate that the plants grow in. The difference in the spring is, it, especially up here, because it's so dry in May, it's dramatic. If, uh, in our community garden, we, we rent one plot, we fenced in two plots, and our next-door neighbor had the, <coughs> the same thing. I, we actually gave her some starts. So we, we know they have the same, she had the same plants, she had the same soil. Ours were under the row covers, hers weren't. In two weeks, ours were four inches taller than her plants. Wow. It, it, was, they, it was like they were completely different plants. It was amazing. Yeah, it's incredible for in the spring and fall and in my horticulture business. I buy it by the long wall, too. And, and by the way, I called Mill and Feed. They sell it uh, six foot by 20 foot panels. Is fourteen dollars. The five hundred foot roll is one hundred and fifteen dollars. So if you get four of you together, you can buy a roll and split it up four ways and pay what you, just a little bit more than what you pay for a twenty foot section. Wow, club could do that. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> containers, you know, in the fall when you we have the frost in September and then. Then it's nice for three weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. The containers, I throw that on there, they're good for a couple nights, and then it's great for three more weeks. And everybody yeah. else is just dead. But they're, they're hoops you have. Not mine. No, you don't have to have hoops. With the floating, floating. Have hoops yeah. I have hoops on these, oh, but you don't need it. Well, you, you can literally, it's so it's lightweight, floating. you can just lay it right on. Hold it there. Well, the, the plants do. The, the wind gets mine. I have oh, them. yeah. Sandbags. Um, you can't see it, but what I, what I use, you know those. Those orange bags you get from the Daily News that you always have too many of? Yeah. Fill them with sand. Make little lead weights, little sand weights, and you can just hold your everything down. Little sandbags. Little sandbags. If the sand, if they break, oh no, you've got sand in your garden. Oh, how awful. <laughs> so uh, I used to use used to use stones. That was not a good idea, right? You're always trying to take the stones out of your garden. So one day it occurred to me, it's easier. Uh, so yeah, that works really good to hold them down and. Even in big winds, pretty amazing. Have you figured out how to combat moose? I combat moose with a six foot wooden fence around my yard and neighbors who grow lots of tasty stuff. So they just so far haven't come to uh, the, I did talk to some farmers in the valley. I went on the valley farm tour a couple years ago. And all the farmers had one inch wide white ribbon around the top of their fences. It's electric. Nope. That's what I said. I said, do you have electric fences up? And they said, no, something about that stripe freaks the moose out and they try and they stay away from it. <laughs> oh, hey. Okay. And I don't I, I can't believe it really works. I mean, it's just one of those, yeah, it's not going to work. But all of them had it. So <laughs> either there was a really good salesman on one inch ribbon uh, walking around the valley and all the farms. One inch white ribbon? They probably learned that left to take look. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's, that's, it, they said it's like the, uh, Painting the calibrates on the road and the stage, you know, they they don't put calibrates everywhere, but they paint all the crossings like their skates there. So I don't know if it works, but it's worth a try. It's a lot cheaper it's than cheap try. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the other things that I use I use a lot of soap. Um, I don't buy the safer soap. I go online and find the recipe for 
the same basic thing because there's it's just soap. Uh, and one of the great things about containers is if you get a plant that's under heavy attack, instead of trying to carefully spray it off, you just take the plant, dunk, dip it in the soap, the soapy water, everything gets hit. No question about whether you missed the spot. It looks great. Oh, I'll take the plant to the soap instead of the soap. Yep. Yep, I just make a big bucket of soapy water if I have a bad outbreak. Although, I have to admit, since we really control, learned to control our feeding uh, and keeping the plants healthy, that's really the, the big thing for pests mm -hmm. uh, in our experience. Um, we do a lot of hand picking of slugs in the winter or in the fall. It's, it's absolutely gross, but I haven't found a better method. If anybody has a better method, please tell me after, because mm -hmm. I would love to know. Well, we used to have, we had ducks for one summer, and we didn't have slugs for two years. Mm -hmm. But my wife turned out to be allergic to duck eggs, which is why we had the ducks. So I couldn't justify raising ducks to just eat the slugs. I, I could. Then <laughs> <laughs> sell the eggs. I have to say the ducks were great fun as well. They were the Their most characters. entertaining. Yeah. We have, we have two dogs, chickens. a cat, and when we had the two ducks, we would take the dogs out. We live on a park, so we take the dogs out to play frisbee, and the cat would follow us, and the ducks would follow us. Oh, my God. You haven't lived until you're out playing frisbee and you watch an eight pound duck chasing a frisbee, trying to get <laughs> life. And then people walking through the park, they'd be walking through and. <laughs> <laughs> that was worth the price of admission, right there. What did you do with your ducks? We ate them. Oh, sad. Oh! <laughs> This is production. Yeah. Uh, production. And then the other trick that I do, particularly in my greenhouses, but even on my deck as well, is I grow a plant that I know is attractive to bugs. In my greenhouse, I grow an eggplant. I always grow an eggplant, mm. whether I'm going to get eggplant production or not, um, because it's the first thing the aphids go to. Oh, really? Oh, oh yeah. So, if I, so then I only have to check one plant carefully. I can, I can kind of keep an eye on the other plants, but I have to keep close eye on that eggplant. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever get those eggplants to produce? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, have we usually get an eggplant. Uh, they don't, you know, they're not like you, you read about people with a big plant and they're giving them to all their neighbors because they grow so many. Yeah. That, that's not the case, but uh, not good. I think we're, we've, we've decided, I've talked to my wife into let me spend a little bit more money this year and we're going to actually keep, we're going to turn the thermostat on our greenhouse up to 55 uh, in June because when that rainy season gets here in June and our tomatoes stop setting fruit again mm. because it's too cold at night. I'm going to fix that this year and keep it warm enough so that they keep setting the fruit all through June so we don't have that. Because we we get great fruit, fruit set all through May, then the rainy season hits, it tapers off, and then it comes back again when the sun comes back out in August. So this year I'm going to not let that happen by keeping them warm the whole time. Yes, ma'am? And tomatoes, what causes the, um, some of the tomatoes on um, their skin get so thick? Oh. I would suspect that's probably a water issue. Not enough water? Yeah. So this is this is when I say eat, this is what this is when we eat fresh food. We have been eating fresh salad uh, from our greenhouse since the fifteenth of March. We actually were eating it before that, but just but I was cheating those growing in the house and it's not very good in when it's growing in the house, it's real spindly and but still, the first week of March when you're eating lettuce that wasn't grown in, in a hydroponic thing in New Mexico, it's pretty, it's pretty nice to be eating it out of your garage. But, uh, but now it's spectacular. It's thick and hearty. And we grow, we actually grow our lettuce in flats. We grow, we plant a, a flat a week for lettuce. We eat it when it's this tall. Harvest the flat, start doing, up, doing the next one. Um, this, now we don't have to do that anymore, but in the, in the winter, if you're trying to grow lettuce indoors where it's too warm, um, if you let it get more than about four inches tall, you get aphids, because the plant's just struggling. So you just eat it when it's just using all the energy from the seed.